This is the first of two videos about dry eye. Hello, my name is Craig Blackwell. I'm an ophthalmologist in Santa Cruz, California. In this video, we will cover tear production, tear function, and the basic causes of dry eye. In the second video, we will cover the mechanism of dry eye in more detail, then diagnosis and treatment. Remember, this is for your information and does not replace consultation with your ophthalmologist. The name dry eye sounds simple enough, but the reality is that name doesn't nearly do justice to this subject. Let's start by recognizing that the tear film on the surface of the eye is important for clear vision, comfort, and health of the cornea. The tear film on the surface of the eye is more than just salty water. Let's take a closer look at the section in the orange circle. Here is a magnified view of the cornea and tear film on the surface. We are showing here that the tear film has three layers, lipid, aqueous, and mucin, each of which serves a function. If you had a dry cornea and you put a drop of water on the surface, it would bead up instead of spread out. So, there is a layer of mucin that allows water to spread out over the surface of the cornea. It is produced by the cells of the conjunctiva. The middle layer of the tear film is the watery or aqueous layer. It is produced by the tear gland and constitutes most of the tear layer. On the surface is a layer of oil that acts to reduce evaporation. It comes from oil glands in the eyelids. This will give you a picture of how the watery part of the tear system works. The aqueous is produced by the lacrimal gland, which is located in the eye socket under the brow. The tears descend from the upper conjunctiva and wash over the eye. Then the tears are collected into the upper and lower tear ducts, which connect to the lacrimal sac, which in turn drains into the upper nasal cavity, which is why when you cry, your nose runs, or when you put drops in your eyes, sometimes you can taste them in the back of your throat. Very important in this system are sensory nerves located in the surface of the cornea. They give feedback to the lacrimal gland, controlling the amount of tears produced. They affect baseline production and reflex tears, which are the extra tears produced when something irritates your eye. The oil is produced by my meibomian glands. They are located in the back half of the eyelid. Remember, the oil floats on the top of the tear film, film to reduce evaporation. Lack of that oil is one of the causes of dry eye. Now you should have a pretty good understanding of the multiple parts of your tear system. Before we go on, let us restate that the tear film is important for clear vision, comfort, and corneal health. Regarding vision, here is a simplified diagram of the eye. Incoming light is focused by the cornea and lens, creating an image on the retina. The rods and cones in the retina record the image like film in a camera. Just like the optics in your camera, the quality of the image reaching the retina depends on a clear cornea and lens. However, what the light encounters first is the tear film on the surface of the cornea. To make a good image, the tear film must be smooth and even. To put it another way, when we see patients who complain of intermittent blurred vision, particularly in drying conditions, this is one of the common causes we look for. Regarding comfort and corneal health, the tear film contains a number of substances that are important for the health of the surface of the eye. Consider that there are no blood vessels in the cornea, which means the living cells of the cornea depend on the tear film for their nutritional support. Tears contain, for example, electrolytes, growth factors, antibacterial proteins, suppressors of inflammation, and more. If the tear film on the surface of the cornea is not in good shape, that causes a range of problems varying from mild to severe. At a mild level, your eyes feel sandy, may be worse in dry conditions like in the wind or working on a computer. Vision may be intermittently blurred. At a moderate level, the cells on the surface of the cornea start to suffer damage. That means there is more irritation and worse vision, but more important, there is an escalation in the battle, specifically the onset of inflammation which we will talk more about in a minute. At a more advanced level, there is more discomfort, more inflammation, and then scarring of the cornea. 
That is a short sketch of the range of problems that develop when the tear film is defective. We will now explain how that happens. Technically, names like dysfunctional tear syndrome are used instead of dry eye because they are more inclusive. We will stick with dry eye for simplicity. We will explore the world of dry eye in two parts. First, the direct causes of dry eye, decreased tear production or increased evaporation. And second, if the dry eye is bad enough to cause damage to the cornea, that results in inflammation, which creates a further cycle of problems. The beginning stage of dry eye can occur either because of one, not enough aqueous production, or two, too much evaporation. The most obvious cause of dry eye would be not enough production of the watery or aqueous part, and the most common cause of that is related to age. With age, there are structural changes in the lacrimal gland that look like wear and tear. Also, as time goes by, we produce less of the hormonal signals that tell the lacrimal gland to produce tears. It is mostly related to a class of hormones called androgens. Another cause of decreased tear production is medications. There are quite a number of medications that have dryness as a side effect. For example, antihistamines, beta blockers, diuretics, antidepressants, and so on. Here is one big example. HRT stands for Hormone Replacement Therapy. It is used to help women with postmenopause symptoms. In a large study of 26,000 women, it was pretty clearly established that supplementing with estrogen alone increases the incidence of dry eye by 69%. With estrogen plus progesterone, it is less, a 29% increase in dry eye. Like many things, there is a balance between the beneficial effects of a medication and its side effects. A less common cause is something called Sjogren's syndrome. This is a disease where the immune system is triggered to attack both the lacrimal and salivary glands, resulting in dry eye and dry mouth. One form of Sjogren's involves just salivary and lacrimal, lacrimal glands, while another form involves both glands with the addition of rheumatoid arthritis. Here is another cause you might not expect. Remember the corneal nerves that feed back to the lacrimal gland to regulate tear production. Well, things that cause a decrease in corneal sensation interfere with that feedback, causing a decrease in tear production. For example, LASIK surgery. That is a laser surgery done to change your glasses prescription. At the beginning of this surgery, a corneal flap is cut that severs almost all nerves to the surface of the cornea. In the diagram, that is represented by the red X's. Dry eye is a well-known effect of this, and mostly everyone needs lubricating drops for some months after LASIK surgery. Hopefully, nerves regrow over time, but at six months, over a quarter of people still have dry eye after LASIK. Corneal desensitization also affects people who wear contact lenses, people with diabetes, and people who have certain corneal diseases. The second category of dry eye involves increased tear evaporation. Consider environmental causes. They would be at work when you are in a dry environment, like in an airplane cabin, air conditioning at work, you live in the desert, the wind is blowing. But here is a more subtle thing that affects a lot of people. When you are visually concentrating, like with reading, working at the computer, watching TV, or driving, your blink rate slows considerably to less than half the usual rate. You don't re-wet the cornea enough and it gets dry. When I ask people if there is a pattern to their dry eye symptoms, this is one of the main things I'm looking for. You remember the tear film has an oil layer on the surface to reduce evaporation. That comes from the meibomian glands in the eyelids. In youth, the oil from those glands is relatively thinner and flows easily. As time goes by, there is a change in the oil and it gets thicker, so thick that sometimes it can't get out of the glands. At the microscope, we can see little gold-colored domes covering the oil gland openings. If the oil can't get into the tear film, that is another cause of more evaporation loss. Blepharitis is inflammation of the eyelids from various causes. It has a significant effect on the tear film and ocular surface. Inflammation involving the front part of the eyelid around the base of the eyelashes usually comes from overgrowth of the normal bacteria that live on the skin. 
that can cause irritation of the skin and affect the tear film. For example, one of the things the bacteria make is an enzyme that turns the oil into soap, which is irritating and makes small foamy bubbles in the tear film. Blepharitis can also go along with seborrhea and rosacea. In part one of this section, we talked about the direct causes of dry eye. Following on from there, we're going to look at the consequences of a dry surface, which lead to the process of inflammation. There are several things going on here. With decreased aqueous production or increased evaporation of the watery part, the remaining tears become more concentrated. For those of you with a biology background, that is increased osmolarity. That causes damage directly to the cells on the surface of the cornea and triggers those cells to respond with inflammation. The surface damage also makes the tear film more unstable. Inflammation then spreads to the lacrimal gland where it does ongoing long-term damage and further reduces tear production. This point about inflammation bears repeating because it becomes an important stage in advancing disease. To review, the process begins with the basic causes of dry eye, decreased production or increased evaporation of tears. Symptoms at this stage are usually mild with an occasional sandy feeling and blurred vision. As the tear film becomes unstable and concentrated, there are the first stages of damage to the cornea. That goes along with more discomfort and worse vision. Damage to the cornea triggers the process of inflammation, which causes progressive disease, that is more corneal damage and immune attack on the tear gland. Tear gland damage further reduces tear production and so continues the cycle. In part two, we will show how the above information is used to plan treatment.